Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. This is our monthly open line first Friday program in which you are a very important part of the program tonight because your calls and your email questions about all aspects of the conversion, the journey of the Catholic faith, aspects of uh, what do we believe as Catholics. If you have a question about maybe you're not a Catholic and you would have questions about what Catholics believe or maybe you're a lifelong Catholic and you've wondered about different aspects of what we believe as Catholics, or maybe you wonder what we believed when we weren't Catholic and about our own journey, tonight's your night to ask whatever question you'd like. So you can even begin now to start calling us at 1-800-221-9460, or you can email us at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Now on Open Line First Fridays, I invite someone who's going to be our resident expert for tonight. And I've invited back a good friend of mine, Paul Key. He was on our program about a year ago in which he shared his own journey from the Presbyterian faith to the Catholic faith. He was a Presbyterian pastor, as I was. We knew each other uh, back uh, when we were pastors. And again, a year ago, he talked about his journey. And his journey, if you want to hear the whole thing, is written up in the book Journeys Home. But tonight, he's here as our guest to answer whatever question you might have. And we're also going to talk about that book he wrote called 95 Reasons. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Paul, welcome back to The Journey Home. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's good to see you. I miss you. Yes. <laughs> You're all the way down in Texas, and I'm up in Ohio. Yes. But we have to have some good excuse to get together, and this is as good as any. So it's a, yes. it's a good chance, though, for you to be here to maybe even some of the guests have questions back from your first appearance, I think mm -hmm. last November. It was about then, yes it was. When you were here. But we don't have time tonight for you to go into that whole journey, but maybe as a, as, to bring us back to it, and as a bit of a synopsis, let me ask you a question about your journey. You know that my work with the Coming Home Network, in which I work with Protestant clergy like we were, mm -hmm. in their journey to the Catholic faith, you know as well as I do that the decision for a clergyman to become Catholic brings with it some struggles, some difficult questions about supporting a family and, and the loss of, of vocation, all those issues, as well as, as well as maybe the losing of friends and family and all those issues. So making the decision can be very difficult. As you look back, what was maybe the, the issue or the reason that convinced you that becoming a Catholic was necessary for you and was worth all the sacrifice that may come? Well, there, there really wasn't much question. <laughs> I, I kind of analyze things as I read and as I go through life. And I was a Presbyterian minister, married to a lovely Catholic woman, <laughs> having to preach every Sunday. And I was very aware of a number of the issues that divide the two churches. But as I continued to preach, interestingly enough, off of the Vatican lectionary, which the Presbyterian Church had, had adopted as an alternative set of readings, yeah. I kept coming across these very awkward passages that seemed to me to be more accurately Catholic than they were uh, Presbyterian. And I kept track of them. And when I got to 20, I knew I was in trouble. When I got to 30, I decided, I mean, my conscience demanded that I really follow the direction where I thought truth was or I'm convinced I would have died spiritually. Then I've continued that reflection since, and it first became 60 reasons, <laughs> and then 77 reasons, and then as you and I discussed, we went for 95 reasons. For obvious reasons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because that was the number of, of theses that Luther had posted in his challenges. Yes. Uh, and a bit sheepishly, I approach you as the audience, because back when we were on together a year ago, we were talking about the publication of your book, 95 Reasons, and a lot of people sent in, uh, I think I have 300 names of people that want it, and here it's a year later, and I can tell the audience that this is still a mock-up, but it is now at the printer, it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, and it's an excellent book that, as you said, the 95 reasons, there's probably more than that, but you, you, you group them into 95 mm -hmm. reasons for becoming or remaining Catholic, it's like a catechism in sorts, but what specifically it's aimed at is taking from the perspective of how you saw things as Protestants and then seeing the, the truth and fulfillment mm -hmm. in the Catholic faith, yes. right? Exactly. And so the audience later during the break can see the address if they want to order it now. Right. But 
we're not focusing on selling books. Let's give a reason, though. Give one of the reasons that you sure. found it was so compelling. Well, the first 26 reasons out of my 95 are biblical reasons <laughs> for becoming Catholic. One of them that was just so very obvious, and it amazed me that emotionally as a Protestant, I didn't see this before, is the whole issue of priests being given the authority to forgive sins. And it is so easy, it just rolls off a Protestant's lips, no man can forgive sins. Yeah. Well, maybe before you start in the Catholic reasons, yes. give quickly how you would have thought about that before as a Protestant. Oh, that, that we went directly to God, and because God is God, only God can forgive sins. And I can still remember running around a track jogging with a friend of mine who was a priest, who in the midst of the jogging said, why don't you look and see if Jesus delegated it? <laughs> Which I did, and it's really kind of embarrassing. These are passages it's really hard for a Presbyterian minister to preach on, but Matthew 16, 19, where Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter, and he says explicitly, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Hmm. And then John 20, 22 and 23, you know, Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And what's the first reason for receiving the Holy Spirit? So that if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And I kind of knew I was in trouble when I read that. <laughs> Did you feel as a Protestant pastor that you therefore had that, re that responsibility or that uh, authority to do that very thing? Well, there, there was a distinction. I mean, it is God who forgives sins, but even Calvin taught that uh, when a person had a question of conscience, the pastor should assure that person that they were going in the right direction. Yeah. And I literally had people coming to me to confess sins mm -hmm. when I was preaching biblically, which made me feel a little uneasy, as you would know as a Presbyterian yeah. minister. Yeah. Uh, I think the Catholic Church is really most honest and most clear in saying that a priest, yeah. when he hears confession, has the authority delegated from Jesus to... That was the key I was looking yeah. at. It's kind of like the magic bird thing mm -hmm. on it, you know, yeah. authority. That's right. That's, that was the word I was... Because mm -hmm. we didn't have that authority, and we knew that's we right. didn't have that authority. And the church denied us that authority. Yeah, yeah. The Presbyterian Church yes, denied that's us right. that authority. We, d we knew we didn't have it in our gut to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. So often when people came to us with the problems in their life, it was an under the guise of pastoral counseling, yes. mm -hmm. which was advice at best. That's right. But it wasn't authority. Mm -hmm. and, and this was the, one of the biggest issues. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> of course, this eventually led to your own conversion to the faith, mm -hmm. and maybe even defining in many ways the kind of apostolate that you now direct. direct. Right. Well, very much, I got into um, Catholic apologetics. Which is uh, apologizing apologizing why we're Catholics. Uh, no, you're not feeling sorry. It's a technical <laughs> Greek term that really means defending or explaining the faith. And in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, always be ready for an explanation of the faith that lies within you. And I had been probably effectively Catholic in theology for the last six or seven years of my Protestant ministry. And every time I gave a defense of the faith, I got in trouble. <laughs> and so now I'm, I, I really am happy because with the new catechism and with the foundation of Vatican II, I feel like I, I am really in a position of being able to explain truth. And so my wife and I work together. Uh, we've developed some materials, uh, retreats, courses, classes, mm -hmm. even little sheets. I've got you know, the book here, but I've also got this additional study guide for 11 different issues. Okay which gives about a one or two page summary highlighting the biblical reasons for why we as Catholics call priest father, mm -hmm. why we as Catholics biblically speak about mortal and venial sins. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I enjoy doing that. <laughs> and as a director of evangelization for a diocese, you know, I went back and I looked at the United States bishop's statement on what are our goals for evangelization. And I noticed that the first goal for Catholics in evangelization was not to go out and share the faith, but it was to study the faith and get to know the faith so we could be enthusiastic and want to share it. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways in my work now, I'm able to share these things, and it's a lot of fun. Can I share with you an example <laughs> or two? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this little packet of explanations I have developed out of the questions that students at Texas Tech University or people from the diocese have raised. 
And in there, there is one sheet on why we believe in the distinction between mortal and venial sins. Well, a friend of mine who is a priest, who is ecumenically involved in his community, was speaking to another minister. And they, were, they got into theology, and they were talking about sin. And this uh, conservative, evangelical, biblically-based pastor said, well, why do you guys believe that there are mortal and venial sins? Aren't all sins serious? And I can still remember the grin on this pastor's face when he said, I had your sheet right behind me on the shelf. <laughs> he reached up, said he said it, just showed it to this pastor. The pastor read it and said, gee, that's pretty good. You got any more of those? <laughs> because it, it described, as you do in there, it outlines the teaching of the church on that issue and then backs it up with scriptural with foundation. With the scriptural and the, and the historical foundations. Very good, very good. We've got an email already, so let's bring the, the home audience into tonight's program with our first email. This is from Martha. It says, Marcus, can you explain the seeming conflict between indulgences and the necessity of purgation before entering God's presence? If God's justice demands a certain amount of satisfaction and a soul must be completely holy before entering heaven, how can our prayers gain early release for souls in purgatory? Thank you and may God continue to bless you. Let me read that again. Are you got that? Uh, well, let me take a shot at that. Okay. Uh, it is certainly true that we must be cleansed of our sins, but it is also very clear scripturally, like the uh, redeeming a person from sin, converting a person, uh, covers over a number of sins, mm -hmm. it's said in scripture, and the church has always had the authority to soften or temper punishment. Uh, indulgences are not just money. I think that's where maybe we got into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in terms of if a person during this life demonstrates sacrifices, efforts to help others, then that is a way of uh, gaining reward and that can be mediated by the church in the form of indulgences. Why don't you take a minute. This email followed on discussion of sin, moral mm -hmm. and venial. Mm -hmm. Explain for a, a bit the different ways that Catholics look at sin different than what we did as Protestants that require the need for penance uh, mm -hmm. and indulgences and purgatory. There was no need for that from our Protestant understanding of sin. Well, no, although it was in Scripture. Like in yeah. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16, talks about how <clears throat> we may need to be cleansed as through fire, yes. perfectly consistent with the doctrine of purgatory. Um, the temporal effects of sin, the, the effects of sin in this life remain with us and there is an element of God's justice that one who has done really, really evil things needs to pay for those things one way or another. Uh, and you've got some sins that really do efface, that really do take away the, the grace of, the, uh, of Jesus, take it completely away from us, that's mortal sin, and others, the venial sin, is not that severe, does not take it away that far, and therefore it would only make sense to me and is consistent with Scripture that the level of punishment or purgation in order to be ready to face the Lord would differ. Mm. And because the church is merciful, just like we would in dealing with a person who'd made an error and we were punishing them, we would not seek out the harshest punishment, but we'd, we would seek out really the gentlest punishment that would get the, re the, the repentance and the redemption of the sinner. Mm -hmm. And when r indulgences are rightly used, that is the direction they should take people pastorally. <clears throat> this is where I get in trouble because I'm not a church theologian. Yes. But we have to make sure that we recognize that indulgences and purgatory uh, deal with the temporal side of sin, mm -hmm. but not the vertical side of sin. Mm -hmm that determines whether we're saved or not. Mm -hmm. All right, when we do an indulgence, when we do penance, when we, mm -hmm. that's not whether we're going to go into heaven or not. That's what the binding and the loosing is all about yes. mm -hmm. in the absolution mm -hmm. as we seek forgiveness from God. That writes us with God, yes. but there's still the temporal side. Mm -hmm. And the example is, I can break a window, I can go to the owner and say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. forgive me. They can forgive me. But you still need to replace the window. I still got to replace the window. You know, <laughs> I'm right. forgiven. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm united <clears throat> with God again. But there's right. still the temporal effect of sin yeah. that needs to be taken care of. I think in what I said, I assumed that there was repentance yes. in the case of serious sin. Right. When there's rebellion and a refusal 
to repent of that serious sin, doesn't make any difference what you do. And that's when it becomes mortal. That's mortal right. meaning we're separated from God. That's right, and we die eternally. Very good. We have another um, email, dear Marcus and guest. This is from Nate. From what I understand, the Catholic Church has rejected Luther's formula, quote, at the same time just and sinner, quote. Yet I heard priests and other people in the church talk about themselves and those in the church all being sinners. What is the understanding the Catholic Church has of this? Good question. Yes, I wish I could answer that really specifically in terms of the agreement that the Catholic Church has with the Lutheran Church on justification. I can't yeah. answer that specifically. Yeah. Um, what really comes to my mind most immediately is a very serious awareness that even after we've come to faith, been baptized, entered into the church, been, not, been marked as sons and daughters of God, the effects of original sin still remain and our, our passions remain disordered. And concupiscence is the technical term for that. And that still leads us to commit sins, which is why we need the practice of confession. The idea in Luther's, if I understand it correctly, is that because we do not have freedom of the will, mm -hmm. is that we never in this life can reach a state where we can not sin, where we can resist sin. Mm -hmm. We as Catholics believe that by grace, we can grow in holiness more mm -hmm. and more and more to be able mm -hmm. to say no to sin. Mm -hmm. A Lutheran said, I'm a sinner till I die. There's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm covered over with the grace mm -hmm. of Christ. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's what he meant by always a sinner, and covered by Christ. Really, right. in, in Luther's understanding, we never can ever be righteous mm -hmm. this side of heaven. We as Catholics no. believe that by His grace, we can in fact grow in righteousness, grow in yeah. holiness. We can at least grow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we must grow. If there are no signs of right. some kind of growth, that would appear to indicate that the grace had been in vain. Right. Let's take our first caller this evening. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, uh, my name is Matt, and I'm from Olmsted Falls, Ohio. Hello, Matt. And uh, I want to thank the Lord uh, f for you and your show, Marcus. I really think it's great. Well, you're uh, from Ohio, so you've got to be good yourself. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, is uh, we're a Catholic family. I had a very heated discussion with my sister. She says, uh, why can't uh, women be priests? Why can only men be priests? So we <laughs> thought we would call in and ask you that Good. question. You wanted to put Paul on the hot seat tonight, didn't you? Thank you. That's a question that yes. floats around tonight. <clears throat> it almost seems like an unloving thing for us to say that women cannot be priests. But I would like to make two responses to that. Good. First of all, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, in one of his writings early on, pointed out that almost all of the religions in existence at the time of St. Paul had female priests. And the Christian faith was distinctive, and the Judeo-Christian tradition was distinctive and separate from the world, not conforming to the world, mm -hmm. but distinct from the world in not having women as priests. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be informed today because, in my opinion, we've had about 30 years of politically correct sociology in which we've tried to pretend that men and women are the same and identical. Men and women are identical in the respect and the dignity that they have before God, but it's very clear scripturally and spiritually that we have a somewhat different role. And I would respond that one of the gifts of the Catholic tradition and the Holy Father in holding to this is to really put the pressure on us as men to be spiritual leaders, to call forth the gifts and the abilities of women in many different ways, but to still make certain distinctions that demand that men take responsibility. It's kind of like this fuss about sexist language, you know, uh, where we're not supposed to use the generic term man. You know, God created man, male and female created he them. I have the feeling that God knew that we men were a little harder to get at, that our egos <laughs> were a little thicker. And so he defined the genetic term so we couldn't miss it. <laughs> Good point. Of course, the other issue that comes up with this, I think Father Luther mentioned mm -hmm. last week, and that is the misunderstanding of a person's right to be a priest. All right, nobody has a right to be a priest, but it's according to the calling and plan of God. That's right, because being a priest is a servant. It's a, That's right. It's a surrendering and accepting of God's calling and gift. Mm -hmm. um, and the church is 
as you mentioned, this is just not a tradition of just the Christian mm -hmm. era. This has been protecting of a tradition, mm -hmm. a Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah. Let's take another email. This is from Julian Smith. Sirs, how do we know with any degree of confidence that beliefs in the real presence and Marian devotion were in fact what the apostles believed before they died? How early, for instance, does written record of the real presence in the Eucharist go back and what would be the earliest known prayer to Mary? Thank you, Julian Smith. Oh, let's take on the Eucharist one. That, I think that's really obvious because it goes right back to Scripture. Hmm. There are two references in Scripture that made me absolutely say there has to be a real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. One is 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 23 and following, which are St. Paul's instruction for the Lord's Supper. But verses 27 and following are a warning where he says, if you approach the Lord's Supper without being rightly prepared and without discerning the Lord's body, you will get in trouble. <laughs> you will get sick and some of you have died. Now that means that there has to be some kind of objective power in the Eucharist because otherwise it would be just dependent on my subjective, my personal feelings. And if I'm, if I'm oriented right, I'll get something out of it, yeah. but if I'm not, I won't. Yeah. In this case, it's really clear that there's something there. A sign and a symbol doesn't do that. Uh, a mere not, sign, not if a it, mere symbol. It's not reality. Yeah. Right. Uh, then in John chapter six, you know, there's, there's the development of where Jesus says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And at the end of that passage, around verses uh, 55 through 66, uh, the Jews are all offended because Jesus is talking literally. And the, the crowds go away and the disciples are in anguish. And if Jesus had not meant that to be real, he would have said, hey, come on, boys, you really misunderstood me. <laughs> but rather he says, no, this is the way it is. Are you guys going to follow me? Where else would you go? Another of course, outside scripture, we have mm -hmm. early Catholic writings in the Didache mm -hmm. and even in Justin Martyr, which talk very specifically mm -hmm. about the Eucharist and uh, the, the, uh, the reality of, yes. of the church believing <clears throat> in it, becoming the body and blood of Christ. So mm -hmm. we find it in the early fathers. Another part of that question was the early Marian devotion. Are you very right. aware of the early... You know, I don't have that at the tip of my fingers. I would go back to Jurgens and the history of the early church and his references. Yeah. What really struck me in my, own, in my relationship to Mary was when you get into Scripture and you look at the number of places where Mary intervened oh, yeah. on behalf mm -hmm. of believers to Jesus. And then the other, the other thing that really helped me understand in that context was the role of Mary as the Queen Mother. You know, in the Old Testament, if you look in a, in a concordance and look at up Queen Mother, it's very clear that that had become an institution in the monarchy of Israel, starting with Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And so it made perfect sense to the early church that that role of queen mother, which to us in America is completely foreign because we do not have royalty, but that if Jesus is king of king and lord of lords, then the second most approachable person in the entire kingdom is going to be Mary. And so the development of that intercessory prayer would have been very natural. Now let me refer also just one other. A lot of times we as Protestants believed that it was wrong to intercede through saints or Mary or anybody else. And William Barclay in his uh, Bible commentaries on Romans, I'm sorry, in Revelation 5, 8, pointed out the entire history and heritage of the role of angels and other personalities in carrying prayers to heaven and the role of intercessors that was present. Hmm. So it's been present from the very beginning. Yeah. One, one uh, the problem w with our background, because our heritage was to avoid Mary, mm -hmm. and therefore it was easy to kind of whitewash her in scripture, not see, read right past her whenever mm -hmm. we'd see her right. mentioned. And I think that's one of the, the important things, especially for our non-Catholic uh, listeners to look through a concordance at the many of mm -hmm. the great sections in early Luke and such where mm -hmm. Mary is mentioned. I think one that jumps out at me that I never saw mm -hmm. was in Acts, just before the Pentecost. It says, all these, referring to the apostles, mm -hmm. with one accord devoted themselves in prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, it emphasizes her. Yes as a, a unique person in that mm -hmm. gathering. And um, 
Uh, <coughs> oh, I, don't know what I was going to say. I was trying to remember the earliest prayer to Mary that I know of. Mm -hmm. I read was uh, on the walls of the catacombs. Mm -hmm. So during mm -hmm. the days of the catacombs, during the days of the martyrs, mm -hmm. there is an early prayer asking for Mary's intercession. So right. I know it goes way back. Let's well, take this question because it follows right on what we were talking mm -hmm. about. This is Frank and Wade Park. Uh, do any Protestant churches have a valid Eucharist? Likewise, do they have a valid priesthood? I have several Protestants who believe they eat Jesus' flesh and blood. I know several Protestants who believe they eat Jesus' flesh and blood when they receive their communion. Please comment. That's a tough one. Uh, I would look at it, first of all, in terms of what are people's intention. Because as I understand the Baptist tradition, you don't even have sacraments there. Yeah. You have ordinances, things that we do because Jesus ordered us to do them. And they are clearly taught as uh, signs or symbols of, a, of something that's not really there. Mm -hmm. I think there are other Protestants, including some Calvinists, who really do believe that they are doing what the Lord does, yeah. or at least what He intended. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult question because I think the really strict guideline in the Catholic Church is uh, no, the real priesthood doesn't exist outside of the... Uh, yeah. uh, this gets sticky because, yeah. well, outside of the Catholic Church, outside of the Orthodox tradition, outside of the Eastern Catholic churches. I mean, yeah. And, and it, there are other churches that have, and the key issue here is apostolic succession. Mm -hmm. And that is what is behind a valid mm -hmm. sacrament or a valid priesthood. Right. And so by the teaching of the church, those churches that do not have a valid apostolic mm -hmm. succession, therefore, cannot have valid sacraments of the priesthood. And I think in your explanation, you're being very pastoral. You're being mm -hmm. very kind because we also recognize that God has the mercy and can give grace mm -hmm. in many different ways. But the teaching of the church is yeah. that without apostolic succession, they cannot have a valid Eucharist or a valid priesthood. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to our next question? Hello, what's your, your name and where are you calling from? Uh, hi, my name is Martha. Hello. And I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio. From Columbus. Hello, Martha. Hi. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, yes, I wanted to know, um, as I was born and raised Catholic, and I wanted, I wanted to know, can I marry someone of a different faith within the Catholic Church? Um, Is that another Christian faith? A I'm Christian sure, denomination? I'm, assu I'm assuming she means, can she marry outside the Catholic faith another a non-Catholic Christian, and still herself receive the sacraments of the church. Oh, let me respond to that. As a pastor, I, I was involved in a number of relationships like that. The important thing there is Not to... Not yourself, me as a pastor helping... Uh, out the, well, as a pastor, yeah. uh, but I also married a Catholic. That's right. <laughs> I was a Presbyterian, I married a Catholic. The important thing is the church has guidelines and provisions for doing that. Yeah. And for example, uh, my wife approached her pastor and the bishop, and we had permission, and so I was married in Our Lady of Grace Catholic Church in Lubbock, Texas, mm -hmm. with permission of the church, and according to its guidelines. Uh, there is considerable flexibility in doing that. Um, one of the frustrations, Marcus, here, I, I want to make some other pastoral responses, yeah. and we don't have time. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm getting into doing more now are some retreats on these 95 reasons and different issues where we have time to dialogue and to talk, yeah. to get into depth, because there would be some cautions. I'll give you one example. When a, when a person who's a Catholic, who knows what it means to be a Catholic and what the sacrifice of the Mass means in terms of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, if you marry into a Christian tradition that avoids the concept yeah. of sacrifice, you may be marrying into a situation where you are committed to loving your spouse as Christ loved the church, all the way to, the, to Holy Week, the sufferings and His crucifixion, and that person you may be marrying has no intention of sticking in there like that. Mm -hmm. So I think one wants to be very cautious. I was reminded of, of a very difficult passage that we had recently in the Mass from Luke. That is not an easy <clears throat> passage, but it calls us to examine very deeply what we believe as Catholics. Because it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And the issue is there is not that being a Catholic means we hate our family, 
-hmm. But the reality is that sometimes our, our commitment to be faithful to Jesus Christ and his church, it might bring division in family. Well, truth usually brings yes. division. Yes, so the danger is mm -hmm. when a person who's a Catholic decides to marry outside the church, I think they need to examine their own understanding of their mm -hmm. Catholic faith and their commitment to it yep. and recognize that being unequally yoked is very difficult mm -hmm. at best. Yeah. At the same time, there's an opportunity, as my wife <laughs> witnesses. <laughs> maybe. Well, I mean, it can it be, maybe. it's dangerous. It maybe. It's dangerous. Uh, this is where I would argue for Catholics to get to know our faith better. We have the best explanations. We have the most thought through understanding. And as our bishop has said, uh, it's part of our goal is to help other Christians to become better Christians. Now the content for that being a better Christian, I think is usually found in Catholic teaching. Hmm. And like I became incrementally closer to the Catholic Church across the years because I started to receive that teaching and see that teaching. That can happen. But you can also self put yourself in a situation yeah. where you're set up just to be had. Yeah, you got to be real careful. Let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with Paul Key and your questions about the journey home. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We're having a meeting tonight with this resident expert, Paul Key, to answer whatever questions you might have. We're putting them on the spot here with some very good questions. Thank you for those good questions. Before we get back, though, into our discussion, we're going to take just a moment. As you all know, those of you who listen to the news, read the paper, know about the, uh, the effects of Hurricane Mitch in Central America. Uh, and we need to pray for the many people, many families who have been affected by this. If you're interested in helping with hurricane release, relief, there's an estimated of over 9,000 dead. Imagine that. We take our lives so granted, uh, we, all the parts of our life we assume and imagine yourself in this situation. So if you would like to help and call Catholic Relief Services to help, the number is 1-800-235-2772. I'll give that again. one 800 2352772 All right Paul let's jump back into it again are you ready Sure because we have an email waiting for us immediately This is from Jonathan Dowell from Youngstown Ohio he asks dear Marcus and Paul <coughs> I have recently converted from the Southern Baptist denomination <coughs> to the Byzantine rite of the Catholic Church It has been a wonderful experience to participate in the fullness of the Catholic faith how do we as Catholics explain Hebrews chapter 6 where it says that we cannot be saved and lost and then saved again? Please explain this in the light of the forgiveness of mortal sin. Do you want to read that verse? Would that help? Or? Yeah, in, in Hebrews 6, 4 it says, For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers in the Holy Spirit. Let me just throw in here that this has always been a sticky wicket. Mm -hmm. I know we were Protestants dealing with explaining this because especially our background, you, when, you can't lose your salvation. Or from, you've been predestined to one or the other. Yeah, it's <laughs> like it, that was one of the sticky wickets because given our theological mm -hmm. perspective, how do you explain that from a Calvinist perspective? But what about from our Catholic perspective? Well, from the Catholic perspective, you've got the history of the church. And this is one, and I was a history major in college, and I <laughs> love going back to see what happened. <laughs> and in the early Catholic Church, second and third and fourth centuries, many of you will remember that there was a practice that people took this passage so literally that even though they would come to faith, they would not be baptized until they were on their deathbed because there was no forgiveness for mortal sin. Yep. It was at the time uh, when Hippolytus and Calixtus were in Rome that this debate rose up. And it's a good example, I think, of the way the church guided by the Holy Spirit, resolve some of these issues in the light of the mercy of God. Because you also have in 1 John, where he's very honest about sin, talking about believers, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. 
So that makes it very clear that we can fall into sin, apparently mortal sin, and be cleansed. And what happened in the history of the church was first that very rigorous position. You'll remember that when St. Ambrose was called on by the people uh, of Milan to become bishop, he had not yet even been baptized. <laughs> and they baptized him, took him all through all the orders in a very short period of time to make him bishop because he'd been living out of that understanding. Uh, Calixtus was working with the prostitutes of Rome at that time and working with people who had, had a hard time getting out of that situation. I think at, the time, uh, at that time Hippolytus was arguing that you could have one repentance. That was it. And after Calixtus became Pope, there was an election. Hippolytus lost, Calixtus won, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit led us in the way of mercy. And from that time on it was understood, although with very severe penances. Yeah. If you read this, the, in this in the history of the early Catholic Church, the penances imposed for these sins like for adultery, you'd have to do penance for like 20 years. Yeah, yeah. It took it a little bit more seriously. Than it's the, very serious, but at least there was the possibility of forgiveness. Looking at that passage from the pastoral side is the mm -hmm. way I've tried to explain mm -hmm. it, even as a Protestant, still see it, that it is true in reality that when mm -hmm. people are informed of their faith, experience the blessings, and then fall back into mortal sin, mm -hmm. it is very difficult. Mm -hmm. to bring people back. Mm -hmm. But we should never give up. That's right. We never give get up because mm -hmm. God is all merciful. God knows that angels rejoice in heaven over the salvation of one, a recent mass reading. That's right. And so we, should, we never give up. I don't believe Paul is telling us to give up. He's talking about the difficulty. But, but he is talking about the seriousness of sin. And for yes. example, if we go into the uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, he talks about the sin of the angels and how after one sin they fell and were condemned. Mm -hmm. And for Adam and Eve, after one sin they fell and the consequence of that was felt throughout of all yeah. history. Ignatius' response is, how many sins have we committed? Mm -hmm. And how thankful are we that God is merciful yeah, that we're still around? Drive us to our <laughs> That's right. Good, let's take our next phone call. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Dennis O'Brien and I'm calling from Malvern, Pennsylvania. Hello, Dennis. What's your question for us? And my first question to you is, uh, Marcus and Paul, is that Mary in the uh, Bible is written as uh, uh, Mary Madeline. She is not written as the Blessed Mary. How do, Catholic, how do Catholics, which I am, think of her as the, the Blessed Mother compared to other uh, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and other religions think of her just as Ma Mary Madeline? We, we honor her as the Blessed Mother, and I think that I had a brain injury myself in my years of a year and a half, and I've been always Catholic through my parents, and I've always, she has been there for me, and such as Jesus has been there for me and given me a second chance in life, and I pray to that, but I'm asking you, why is she the saint, and why do we worship her so much comparing to people in the Bible? Thank you for your question. Maybe the first thing to begin is there's a, just a little bit of confusion here between the different Marys, because yes. there's a few of them in there, isn't there? It's four. Yeah, four. <laughs> <laughs> so why'd you make that distinction right off the oh, bat? Oh, Mary Magdalene was uh, a woman who was, uh, had seven demons thrown out of her. Wasn't and the mother of Mary. It's not the, the mother of Jesus. Not the mother of Jesus. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a different person. Yeah. Just a quick correction there, too. Uh, there was a statement that we worship Mary, and Catholics make a distinction between w the worship that is due to God, to the divine persons, a, a very high type of respect that is given to Mary and the respect given to other saints and leaders of the church. We do not worship Mary in the same way that we worship God, but we do give her very high respect. Because yeah. of her fiat and because That's of God's right. choice and all kinds of things. God choosing her be, even before she yes. was born to be the mother of That's Christ. That's right. Now, in terms of how Protestants look at it, I was always encouraged by Billy Graham uh -huh. because after, after a long time in ministry, Billy Graham realized that from his tradition at least, which was the Southern Baptist tradition, we were not giving a biblical honor to Mary. And so he wrote a book on Mary mm -hmm. in the New Testament and called on us to give her honor and respect. I was thinking in our previ on a previous call we talked about the respect to be given to Mary, and it says in Luke, I, be, I believe it's in the Magnificat, where Mary says, and all generations will call, call me blessed. blessed. Yes. Now, when I was a Presbyterian, and I was rebelling against praying the rosary, 
and I was upset at people who honored Mary. Then I read that passage, and I said, whoops, my tradition isn't participating in that biblical injunction. <laughs> That's right. And so I had to revise my attitude towards Mary, which took some time to do. But very important, because it is biblical to call Mary blessed. Let's go to this next email. This, uh, are you ready for this one? This one's from Brian <laughs> Dorman, a good, a good question. I am a freshman high school student. And in religion class today, the priest asked how we would respond if someone said, quote, at the first Lateran Council in 1215, bishops came up with the term transubstantiation. Therefore, one of the fundamental Catholic beliefs was invented, end of quote. How would you respond to that? Oh, that's typical of Protestant criticisms of the Catholic Church when they themselves have not studied the history of the doctrine. Okay. Transubstantiation was a term that developed out of Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy, which had developed in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. The, and it was, it was a very convenient way to describe how the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ, but remain under the, pres uh, the, the appearances of bread and wine. Uh, but the reality of the way the church dealt with that, you go all the way back to the passages we've previously referred to in 1 Corinthians 11 and in John chapter 6, but you also look at the pr practice in the early church of the reservation of the sacrament, the respect given to the sacrament. Uh, by the time you get to the third and the fourth centuries, if you look up in, um, uh, what's the name of the book, the early fathers of the church, Jung, uh, uh, Jurgens. Jurgens. Uh, Three volume book by Jurgens. Yeah. That's right. Uh, if you look up in there, you see in the third and the fourth centuries, clear statements about the real presence of Christ and the importance of that. And there are a number of Protestants who just haven't studied their church history. Well, there's something else in this question. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it's a misunderstanding about what happens when the church finally declares something to be... Also, yes. It's not like it's been invented from mm -hmm. then. It's affirming what the church has always believed, but it's because of the turmoil that mm -hmm. surrounds an understanding of the church, the church has to... Right. Fine. Well, in general, things are not defined until they're challenged. Right. They're just lived out in the life of the church. And if we looked, if we had more time to go into the history of the, of the Catholic Church, we could find a number of times when things were challenged, and that's when the actual def definition came out. For example, uh, the canon of Scripture was not really challenged until the Reformation. And the, and the deuterocanonical books were then challenged by Luther and some others. And They'd been mentioned in some lists before, but that was the first time the church really definitively yeah. stated that they were there. But they'd always been used that way. Yeah. We can go back to the fourth century and see the same list. That's right. Wasn't well, defined. Another good issue is the, the term, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that's right. The second century was the third. I forget. Um, my well, that was the third was and the fourth. Back. Where it is defined, but it's not that the church mm -hmm. all of a sudden invented the Trinity. That's it was right. the belief all along. But given the challenges by Mm -hmm. by heretical understandings of that mm -hmm. teaching, That's it right. had to be defined. That's right. Good, let's go to our next question, if we would, on the phone. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Patty and I'm calling from St. Louis. Hi, Patty. What's my your question? My question has to do with the definitions of tithing and almsgiving. Yes. Is tithing 10% to your church or to your church and to charities? And is almsgiving only above and beyond tithing? Very good question. Depends on how much you, you spend at bingo during the week, isn't it, that the issue? Or yeah. the, no. <laughs> I just opened another can of worms, right. but I'll let you answer both. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I went back when I was a Protestant and did studies into the tithing. If you were a strict Jew, there were three different tithes. Let's see, there was the first fruits, there was the charitable tithe, and there was another tithe. So the Pharisees at the time of Jesus, if they were really going to be serious, gave 30%. Okay? The general guideline, and it's, it's, there's only one specific reference to the tithe in the New Testament, which is Matthew 23, 23, mentioned in passing. I'm assuming that's because Jesus assumed that Christians yeah. would tithe because that was the practice. Uh, the distinction that I'm aware of is now that we should be giving 10% tithe to the work of the Lord. And I may get myself in trouble here with the National Council of Catholic Bishops because there's an awareness that part of the giving that used to be done through the church uh, covered things that are now done by charitable organizations. 
It's my personal feeling that when we're giving the money that should be given in a tithe to the Lord, it should go to an organization that does the Lord's work as opposed to a secular organization. There is a general guideline that has been floating around, though never formally defined in the American Catholic Church, that we should be giving 5% of our income to our local parish, 1% to the diocese, and 4% to charitable giving. That's the tithe. If we then want to speak of offerings, or anything beyond what we're obligated to give, if we want to be generous, we've got to get above the 10%. Uh -huh. And then I was talking with a, a, a man who works at the national level of the Catholic Church, and there are some dioceses in this country where there are some Catholics who are giving as much as 60 and 70 percent of their disposable income for the work of the church, but that's far beyond the tithe. And they're just doing a beautiful job of supporting the work of the church. So much to talk about, so little time. Let's yes. take one more email here while we have a little bit. Uh, I don't really understand the concept of blessing objects or people with relics. On one EWTN show, Father blessed the audience with a relic from Blessed Faustina. Could you explain? That's from K. Right. Uh, Protestants have seemed to think that blessings come through words. <laughs> and Catholics, from the very earliest times, for example, at the time of the martyrs, oftentimes the bones of the martyrs were, were carried and preserved in the churches because to be in touch with the remains of someone that was so holy was seen to be a means of grace. You know, James, I think it's in James 5, 16, says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Yeah. And when there had been somebody who had been just exceptionally holy, there's a sense of a presence of God, even in the remains of that person. And obviously, people were blessed through that because for many, many years, people would not do blessings with relics unless there had been some fruit. I think there had been, an, I think for some of us as Protestants, there had been kind of an ideological reaction against blessings, you know, faith alone type thing. And the, the presence of the holy, which is represented in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, in the respect that we give in the sanctuary of the church, that there is a sense of holy ground in the Catholic Church, very similar to the holy ground upon which Moses stood at the burning bush. It, what often happens, as I think happened during the Reformation, is that because there were abuses mm -hmm. or misunderstandings, mm -hmm. the whole baby's thrown out with the bathwater. Yes. Rather than <clears throat> moving to a more balanced, corrected side, mm -hmm. everything's rejected. And one of the things we That's rejected right. in Protestantism was, was the, the way that God can work through things, mm -hmm. the way things can become channels of grace. Yes. And that was not something that's a part mm -hmm. of our tradition. And we have to be careful even as Catholics that we recognize that there are those in our family and neighbors that don't mm -hmm. understand what we're doing with relics, what we're doing with things. Right. So we need to be able to give the apologetics, the right. reason behind it. Well, and a good guideline is given in the Catechism in number 2111, a warning against superstition and magical thought. Yeah. Very good guidelines that help us to keep things in a right balance. Again, a reminder of the blessing that we have of the catechism. Yes. Paul, it's been a great privilege to have you back. Uh, we're over already? I think we're there. Uh, <laughs> I think we're about time to take a break. So, Paul, thanks again. And it, again, that if anyone wants to find out information about the 95 reasons for becoming and remaining Catholic, it's now mm -hmm. finally at the printer and your other little outlines. And mm -hmm. even you do retreats on these yes. books. If anyone's mm -hmm. interested, they can contact you. Yes. Thanks a lot, Paul. And God bless Thank you, you so and your much. work in the Diocese of Lubbock in evangelization. Thank you, Marcus, and for you here. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some final thoughts on the journey home. We've had a fun time tonight. Paul's done the best he could answering your questions. I want to thank you for the very good questions you've put to him, a real challenge. And I appreciate your prayers because being on live television makes it sometimes difficult to answer quickly good questions like you've posed. As we were talking about a good verse to end with tonight, we're drawn back to the verse which he mentioned, which I've mentioned many times, and it's a challenge to us to be able to give a reason for our faith. And I'm going to read the whole context of 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 13 
through 17. Listen to the whole context and the importance of us being able to defend our faith. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is right? I think a lot of times we don't share because we're afraid. But who's there to harm you? But even if you do suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, reverence Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence, with charity and love. Mm -hmm. And keep your conscience clear. In other words, our lives need to proclaim our faith also. What we proclaim with our mouth must be witnessed in our life. So that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. Our lives should be a witness of Christ in word and deed. And Paul has shared that tonight. He's talked about the different aspects, questions about our faith, but also in his own work in evangelization for the Diocese of Lubbock, in the retreats that he gives, in his writings. He's deeply in joy for being a Catholic and to proclaiming the joy of being a Catholic. Well, we're on the journey together. Every week I have the great privilege of introducing you to men and women who've made this journey following the call of Jesus Christ. I particularly ask your prayer this week for a number of private petitions for men and women that I'm working with in the Coming Home Network who are considering coming home to the Catholic faith. It involves great sacrifice in their life, challenges to their vocation, sometimes even challenges to their marriage, difficult decision. Sometimes they feel very, very much alone. But your prayers are very important. I also ask your prayers for Mother Angelica and the network, all the work that she's doing. But let's remember to keep each other in prayer. We are called to make a defense for our faith, regardless of our surroundings, so that through our lives, Christ can be seen and witnessed and believed. Let's keep each other in prayer. God bless. Thank you.